Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak today. Um, so I've been given the um, brief to talk about life after transplant and, and that's very complicated, um, complex, lots and lots of things to cover. Um, my, most of my talk is around donor transplant, so transplants from, from using a donor cells, um, but there's certainly some take home messages for, for people who have had um, autologous transplants um, and that that's using um, the patient cells. So look, I hope that all of you can take away something from, from, from this talk and I'm happy to share my slides with, with all of you. Um, so just uh, I'm, I'm going to talk very briefly um, and I'm happy to expand on the recovery of transplant going to talk about some of the more common present um, complications um, that we see after transplant some of the recommendations um, to try and reduce those risks of complications and then some of the more practical things that that we um, advise to, to help you recover from a transplant so one of the first questions I often get asked from patients when they're coming for a transplant or they're, or they're just recovering in the early phases is how long is it going to take for me to get over my transplant? Um, and when we talk about autographs, so that again that's um, using the patient cells. So generally I say look you need to think about your transplant and your recovery from an autograft, uh, give it about three months. So approximately a month in hospital, it's usually a little bit shorter, um, and that's really having that intensive chemotherapy followed by the transplant itself and, and having some of the side effects from that treatment. And once you've recovered from that, then you <coughs> commonly discharge from hospital. And some of those main um, side effects from treatment are diarrhoea um, and infection, and, and some of you may be very familiar with that. Um, but once you've recovered, really, the, you know, you need to give yourself another six to eight weeks to recover. And the key things that, you know, we've seen in, in this period of time is a lot of tiredness. You know, a lot of people are very surprised at how, how tired they are. Um, and I would certainly, you know, um, see a lot of, you know, people don't really have a great appetite during that period of time. Um, and that's really not because you're feeling nauseated and sick, but it's just because your gut's been really upset in the, in the transplant. You know, you're just recovering from your treatment. And it's important that you can eat what you can, try and drink plenty of fluid. Um, your bowel habits will return to normal. A lot of people get diarrhea, but they, they do come good. You know, your gut's been upset, it just takes time to heal. And um, you need to stay away from lots of people and sick people. Um, but generally three months and you know if people are working um, and they're thinking about going back to work I usually say look you, you, you should be good to to be um, going back to work and, and functioning at, you, at your normal um, at about three months. So when we talk about post allograft so that's a, a donor tra you know a, a transplant using someone else's cells um, after that initial hospital admission I would expect you know the your recovery to be up to 12 months. So it can be less, slightly less, and it can be more, but generally it's around 12 months. The, you know, it's a very, very prolonged recovery. And you, whatever you do, whatever you try to do to make that happen quicker, it's, you just can't force it. Your body will recover when it does, and it's roughly about that period of time. And really, that, you know, that sounds very um, overwhelming and a, and a long time, so you, you really need to approach your recovery in stages. So essentially, really those first few months following your transplant and then up to six months, up to 12 months, and then beyond 12 months. So why does it take so long? Um, and this is really about around donor transplants I'm talking about again. So if we think about what we are transplanting, we're transplanting an immune system. So it's not something so simple like a Heart. I know that's not a straightforward transplant, but it's not like a physically take something and put it into the patient and then, and then, and then manage it. Transplanting the immune system is about getting some of these initial seeds, if you like, and, and, and putting them into the patient and, and getting them to grow. And really you need all these cells which make up the immune system to have a fully functioning immune system. And that period of you know, that, that sort of growth, if you like, of all these blood cells is called engraftment. So engraftment, that's all, you know, establishment of all your immune blood cells. Um, 
once you've got all of those blood cells, you've got a good working immune system. An immune system is really important in protecting you from infection. That full engraftment takes naturally two years to occur. So that's in a donor transplant, in, a, in an autograft, uh, you know, using the patient cells. Um, that sort of period of time is sort of three to six months. Okay. So that's just the natural course of when we do a transplant. So, um, and this is really just a, a, a graph to show you that, you know, the set, all these different cells of the immune system recover at different phases. So you'll all be very familiar with neutrophils and neutrophils recover really quickly. And so that's when you leave the hospital, you've actually got a pretty okay neutrophil count, but you're kind of missing all the other cells of the immune system. And, and that's what these are. And they take up to two years to, to you know, establish themselves. There's a couple of other things that also can slow your engraftment. Um, infections, so infections, particularly viruses, are, are quite common um, after a transplant. Some of the medications that we give, things like prednisone, dexamethasone, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, etc. So again, in a donor transplant, if the donor and the patient are, have a, a different blood group, then that sometimes can slow that process as well. Um, cord blood transplants, using a cord as the, as the cell source, um, poorly matched transplant. That's not something that we do now very often, but, but if we need to, it can slow the engraftment and, and old age. So really, this is not, you know, I don't want you to try and remember all this. It's really just trying to help you understand why your recovery takes so long. And during that time when you're waiting for your new immune system to develop, um, you don't really have a very good working immune system. And your immune system is really important in fighting infections. And so if you, you, know, you don't really have a good immune system, you are at a high risk of infection. Um, and you may also, during that period of time, then start to develop some of the complications associated with the tr transplant itself. Um, and that can be organ toxicity, so some, um, and graft versus host disease. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those shortly. So when we talk about complications associated with transplant, we kind of put them in into short term, so under one year post-transplant and, and long term. So short term, we see graft versus host disease, particular types of infections, particularly viruses um, and, and disease relapse. Um, po and beyond one year, we see a more chronic form of graft versus host disease. Um, again, organ dysfunction, um, and, and a little bit later on, some secondary cancers. So a lot of these complications are particularly, again, in the allograft. So we only see graft versus host disease in donor transplants, and a lot of the complications that we see after a donor transplant um, are associated with graft versus host disease and the treatment for graft versus host disease. So I forgive, you know, apologise for this very busy slide. Um, and I, you know, it's very confronting to see that there are a lot of complications or potential things that may occur after a transplant. And this is um, really, you know, just a little bit of a, a snapshot of the more common things that we see after transplant and they can range greatly between patients. And what I've put there in red are the more common um, things that we see after a transplant. So it can affect your eyes, your mouth, um, the skin, muscles, joints, um, bones, can weaken your bones. Um, it can affect some of your um, glands, particularly the thyroid gland, which then can have knock-on effects. And so I'll talk a little bit more about some of the more common things that we see. So remember, these are potential complications. Okay, they're not a given, but they're things that, you, that may occur. Um, so, so talking a little bit more about what is more common. Um, graft versus host disease. So, so again, that's very unique to donor transplants. Um, and, and what essentially it is, it's the donor cells attacking the patient. So I'm the donor and you're the patient and me, uh, you know, as a, my immune cells only like Julia and they don't like anything else. So they're, they're programmed to only like Julia. If there's anything foreign 
or a bad Julia cell, it will get rid of it. So now Julia is in you, you know, the patient. And once it starts working and functioning, it's going to say, mm, well, there's no Julia cells. Hang well, this is not Julia. And it will start to try and get rid of it. Okay, so, and that is essentially what is happening is the donor cells are seeing the patient as a foreign thing and try to get rid of it. Um, and then we start to see, and, and, and it will attack healthy tissue. And that's when we start to see the signs on the symptoms of graft versus host disease. So graft is me, the host is the patient. Um, GVHD, because we all love acronyms in healthcare. But it also has a very good benefit, because that new, those new donor cells will see the disease cells, if there's any left, if there's any leukaemia or lymphoma or myeloma, and that will see that, that is foreign as well and get rid of that. So that's a good thing, that's a good component of graft versus host disease. But unfortunately it attacks the good stuff as well. So we, there are acute and chronic forms of graft versus host disease. Acute is what we, a, a form of the, the disease that we see very early on after transplant within the first three months. It's not that common, um, but we still occasionally see it. Um, what is more common is the chronic form of graft versus host disease, which occurs any time after you transplant, three months to, to years post-transplant, but commonly within two years. Um, it varies greatly between patients, how they present, how long it lasts, um, and that is, there's a huge, huge variation in, in how it presents. Um, and really it can affect you anywhere in the body. And I just really wanted to sort of put this quote up about a patient because I thought he, he really nicely described what graft versus host disease is. And this is a man living with graft versus host disease. Um, so he said, my brother's blood trying to work out where it is and my body trying to work out who is turned up. This arrangement is complex but very beneficial. If my brother's blood is unhappy, not only will it cause havoc in my body, but it will be even more upset should it meet any uninvited and very unwelcome leukaemia cells. So that was a really nice way of describing what, what graphosis host disease is. So the chronic form, as I say, is, is more common, common what we see, and, and it may occur any time after three months when we're weaning some of the immune suppressive drugs like cyclosporin. Um, and the most common presentation is it can affect the, makes the eyes, the mouth and the skin, like a drying effect. Um, and it can also affect the lung function, so the lungs become a little bit more rigid and they, they're not able to, to do their job properly. So you're more prone to infections. Um, and it certainly can affect the vaginal tract and, and make it quite dry. Um, so really, you know, there, it can affect your gut and your liver as well. That's quite a common place. Um, but the, the symptoms really depend on, on where it affects you and, and um, in, in your body. But again, I just want to sort of you know, reiterate that it is a hugely variable between patients. Um, and I would say, certainly in my experience, that the majority of patients who develop graft versus host disease have a mild to moderate form. So what is the treatment? Um, it's prednisone. So that, so prednisone is a very good drug at suppressing the new immune cells. So really what graft versus host disease is telling me is that you've got this new active immune um, cells in the body and it's causing problems in the patient so I want to put my foot on it suppress it down just dampen it down that activity and prednisone is really good at doing that and essentially you know we we can add in other types of drugs that do that but prednisone is the best but there may be other drugs like tacrolimus um, microphenolate cyclosporin can also do that but prednisone is the gold standard um, and we really just treat the patient and, and um, adjust doses and, um, and the length of the treatment according to how the patient responds. So, um, you know, we may introduce prednisone and the patient very quickly, their symptoms improve. And then we can start to drop the prednisone and then things are stable and then it may flare up again. So we have to add in more prednisone. So it's this juggling act just really depending on how the patient's responding. But we hope over time, and, and it generally happens, that we, you need less and less of the treatment to control and manage the symptoms um, to the point that you need hardly any, if any, and you have no symptoms. And that is our goal. 
um, but it's unpredictable as to how, how long that may be in that individual. Unfortunately, you know, as with many, as with all drugs, um, there are uh, side effects um, and we start to see quite significant side effects associated with prednisone if we use it for a long time, so generally more than a year, or in very high doses. So that's 50 milligrams um, on a daily basis and that is for a long time, you know, for months and months. Um, and we start to see it can affect your bones and muscles, can make them very weak, can cause diabetes, um, increase your blood pressure, can cause havoc with some of your hormones, um, weight gain, and, and it can increase your infection risk. So if we're suppressing that immune system because it's playing a bit of havoc, then, you know, again, you don't have a good working immune system, so it means your infection risk is a little bit higher. Graphosis disease and dryness of the eyes, skin and mouth is probably the, the most common presentation that we see after a transplant, after a donor transplant, um, when we think about complications and particularly graphosis host disease. And it is a dryness. Um, so, it, um, so the mouth is the most commonly affected area and it, and it's, you know, it is a dry mouth. Um, and regardless of how much fluid you may drink or um, it, it feels dry and it, um, it can have an increased sensitivity Tea to particular types of foods, particularly spicy foods, alcohol, um, and even things like toothpaste. Um, but there's lots of things that we can do to help manage that. Sometimes it can be painful, um, and we know that there's an increased risk of dental carriers. The skin is also very, very commonly affected. Again, it's like a dry dryness. It's commonly affects around the trunk. Um, and, and less so in the arms and legs. Um, this is the most common area. And it's like a, like a scarring um, where your skin becomes tough and, and inflexible. It's like you, um, that sort of natural thing that we probably all sort of don't even think about. It, it just becomes a little bit tougher. Um, and it certainly can become very um, sensitive to the sun and to, and to cold. Um, the eyes, again, dry, they can feel gritty. Patients describe it's like having sand in your eyes. Um, and they're itchy, they can look red and sore. Um, very sensitive, again, to the sun and to the wind. Um, but again, this, you know, it's variable between symptoms. Some people have an annoying dry mouth and their skin's kind of okay and they've got to use a lot of moisturiser, but their eyes are the most troublesome. So it really does vary greatly. Um, organ toxicity, so um, you're probably wondering what, what, is, what is that? That's actually a liver. Um, so it's a, it's a sick liver. So really, what does organ toxicity mean? It really means that, um, you know, a lot of the treatments that we give um, are very toxic on your organs so, um, and, and can make your organs not work well. So when I talk about organs, I'm talking mostly about the kidneys and the liver. Um, we give a lot of medications and, and, they, and they are toxic on, on your organs. Um, and not just chemotherapy and radiation, but antibiotics, um, anti-nausea drugs, um, and a lot of, lot of anti-infective medications that we give. Steroids, so prednisone, it can weaken your muscles and your bones. You know, and also people come to transplant and they you know, come with other you know, medical problems. Um, people come with hypertension and diabetes and so there's already can be some degree of organ damage. So diabetes, you know, you can have some degree of kidney dysfunction or even patients with myeloma, they may already have a little bit of kidney um, failure um, and sometimes a transplant can just speed that process up or make it a little bit worse. So just, you know, um, and a transplant's not going to make it better. Um, and generally as we age, unfortunately, you know, things don't, you know, things don't work as well as when you're younger and we're all at increased risk of, you know, things like high blood pressure and diabetes and, and even other types of cancer and our eyes aren't getting, you know, the decreased eyesight and, um, and weakening of the bones, like so osteoporosis. And so that's just a natural process as we get older. So it can also affect your hormones. So hormone problems, bones and blood sugar. So that's like a package that's put together, what we call endocrine. Um, and that's a specialty of endocrinology. Um, and we look at, you know, there's a, a cluster of medical problems 
um, called metabolic syndrome that we do see in, in patients post-transplant, um, and that includes high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, high blood sugar, weight gain, um, and you know when your hormones are, you're not producing as many natural hormones like your female hormones and your male hormone testosterone, progesterone, etc then, then you, you end up with some of these other symptoms like thin, dry hair, make you feel fatigued, um, can weaken your bones, um, and can lead to abnormal menstrual loss and even early um, menopause and low libido in men and women. So um, we also see a lot of complications that can affect the sexual and reproductive health. Again, low libido and, and infertility in men and women. Certainly, early menopausal symptoms in women, um, and certainly in my experience, I you know sort of see a lot of patients um, with who who complain of hot flushes. Um, Graphos is host of the vaginal tract again. Again, it's you know irritated and dry. It can make intercourse very painful, um, and and it's you know it's a, a significant problem. Um, and we can we can see not so not as often as, as the other symptoms increased risk of infections and cancers of the genital area. So can we treat these treat these and can we can we prevent these complications? So the short answer is yes. Um, so treatment. So any type of graft versus host disease we manage with prednisone or immune, some sort of immune suppression regardless of what the, the symptom is. Um, so when I talk about topical, that means just directly on the area. So you can have um, eye drops into your eyes um, or we can give you tablets. So it just works everywhere. So you can have a combination or sometimes people only need eye drops to manage their symptoms. Um, or you can have cream on, you know, on the affected area on your skin. Or, so that's what that means. Um, and really all those other late effects that I was talking about, like high blood pressure or high blood sugar, high cholesterol, it really depends on what that is and we can manage that according to, to what the problem is. And you know, and I say high cholesterol or high blood pressure, it might, may just mean that you just need to take a, an additional medication. And I don't mean to you know, say that with lightness because you take many, many medications, um, but it may just be as simple as that to manage that particular problem. Um, you know, and there's certainly a lot of specialists with expertise in, in managing a lot of these complications. And you know, the, the key, the, the message here is if you have any symptoms and you think, oh, it's like, you know, 12 months after my transplant, it's nothing to do with that and, and it's not important, you need to tell us because maybe it is and maybe there's something that we can do that's very effective for you. You, need, you should always tell us. So what can we do as clinicians? We, you know, it's certainly very well recognised within the international transplant community that there are complications associated with transplant, whether it's a donor transplant or a transplant from yourself. Um, and the, and the, you know, the thing that we want to do is screen and monitor patients with the aim of preventing some of these complications detecting them early and treating them early. And by doing that, and we already have the evidence to, to show that if we can get in early and treat them, then we can reduce the number of complications and, and certainly the severity of some of those complications. And really having some consistent follow-up and seeing patients regularly, um, you know, ensures that you're getting, you know, someone's looking at you and just, you know, a good, good overall assessment um, and that you're getting the, the access to, to treatment that you should, should be having. This is um, the Australian Bone Marrow Transplant Registry, the Americans, the Europeans. This is just a local one that we have in one of the states of Australia and New South Wales. The New Zealand um, data, um, they are part of our, our, of our group. So, you know, there's, there's certainly recognition that, that, that this is a problem and we need to manage it. So, and what we really term that, uh, um, that sort of follow-up, if you like, it's called long-term follow-up. You may have heard that banded around, and it's all about tied in with survivorship after transplant and, uh, uh, and after treatment. And generally, it kicks in at 12 months. And again, it's, you know, for autographs as well, you know, for all transplant patients. Um, and it should be, and it's for life. Um, and it involves, you know, ver seeing various specialists, um, and having various tests. 
Um, and, and usually that is followed by one lengthy appointment. So where I work, it's, we, we put aside an hour um, to discuss those test results. Um, and then we would do an extensive physical examination and, and really address any other issues or any, anything that, that the, you know, we need to address for that patient. Um, and that's why we make it a, a lengthy consultation and we make a bit of a plan for the subsequent year. So it really should be an annual follow-up of just looking at long-term, you know, side effects or just long-term follow-up once a year. If you need to, if you've got ongoing problems and then that needs to happen ongoing depending on what those problems are, but you should have this one structured where there's the big pictures looked at. Um, and commonly that happens at a transplant centre, but as the years go on beyond transplant, um, that, that sort of that annual follow-up can happen elsewhere. So, I, so yet lots and lots of tests. I mean, this is what the general population, everyone in the general population should be having these sorts of things happening, through their, mostly through their GP. Late effects, late complications that can occur, and ideally, this should be happening. It certainly isn't perfect in Australia either. We, you know, we struggle to try and see everybody. People get lost to follow up. Um, and in fact, it you know, can be quite overwhelming for people and it can be actually quite a big burden. You know, we recognise that everyone doesn't live in Auckland and Sydney and you know, people live all over the place. It's um, tricky to come back to the main centre or even tricky to get some of those tests but we're just talking about the ideal and we're trying to move forward to make and try and get some consistency that people are followed up because there are lots of th sort of long-term effects that can occur and we, we're all about trying to get you back to a healthy, well, you know, good life. Um, generally, that sort of follow-up starts to occur at about 12 months and we would expect that, you know, lots of people are feeling a little bit more resilient and, and, and getting some control back in their life and to try and make that sort of follow up a little bit easier. Um, you, you know, you, you shouldn't be trying to do that on your own. You, you know, use your transplant team, use the people around you. And one of the key things that I would advise is that you try, you maintain a point of contact at your transplant centre. Um, and stay informed, you know, keep up to date, know what's happening um, and, and take some responsibility and for your health and also, you know, there's some flexibility in, in follow-up. It doesn't all have to happen here at the hospital um, where you have to have all your appointments and tests. It can happen elsewhere and then you just come with your results, etc. And so you've really got to work with your transplant team and your haematologist um, as to ha how that works, but it, but it should be happening. So, and, uh, so really, what can I expect from my recovery? Um, the first thing I want to say is that you're all very different people um, and you know we're all as individuals we um, our expectations are different um, and they and they will vary um, at different times um, as you recover um, from your transplant um, and people just cope and manage in different ways um, and things that can help your recovery. Again you're not alone you're not doing this on your own it also affects the people that are very close to you so you know, keep that in mind and talk to them. Um, and also, you know, you have a transplant team and they're a very good resource. Um, again, you know, you need to, it's, it's just a good habit to, to look after yourself and live a healthy lifestyle. So we're always hearing, you know, don't smoke. That's probably one of the worst things that you can do to yourself. Um, eat well, keep a, you know, maintain a good weight. All those things are really important to help your recovery from a transplant. Um, and, and, you know, some of those things that I've mentioned, some of those late effects are very, you know, it's hard to hear um, and it can be really hard to deal with. And rather than trying to control and, and set definite time frames, try, you know, a better way of trying to get through your transplant and recover is to try and manage what is happening now or learn ways to manage rather than to control it and set definite time you know goals because it doesn't always happen and then it makes it even harder to try and try and um, get through things so another a couple of other things to consider um, that it's prolonged okay it, your recovery is going to be long particularly for people who have had a donor transplant and even people who have had an autograph so again from your own your own cells you may recover initially very quickly 
but then you can you know there can be some ongoing fatigue for for a long time and 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 we may start to see some of the late effects of, of, of your of all your treatment that you've had in the past particularly um secondary cancers and, and organ dysfunction so you know it is a long recovery and there are definitely there are ups and downs it's not going to just nicely go up and get better and better and better sometimes it it, it doesn't always go that way um, and you need to recognize that you're going to have different priorities so before your transplant you probably had you know these were your priorities and after a transplant it might be different and six months later it might be different you need to recognize that that's always changing um, and I, I guess you know one of the key messages is you know it, it is hard to hear that there are lots of complications but you need to know that they do exist this is a really big procedure that we're undertaking um, and, it, and it comes with significant risks it also comes with a potentially fantastic benefits for you um, but you need to recognize that there are risks associated with it um, and that you are very likely to develop some chronic late effect or condition. Okay. Um, but that, there's a huge spectrum of, of, of where that sits. You know, I can think of many patients that sit one extreme, very few patients that sit at the severe extreme and lots of people in the middle. So again, what happens after hospital discharge? When we're thinking about recovery, you know, I'm talking about you know your recovery in stages. Um, so first 100 days, first three months, um, you know, you're all at a high risk of infection. The autographs, you know, that that dissipates quite relatively quickly, but you're still at a risk of infection. Okay, um, it involves lots of hospital visits, lots of blood tests, a little bit less so for post autographed um, but you will all be monitored to some degree um, and certainly in the donor transplant there's a there's a lot of that it's very intensive um, you you know your t taste will be altered you won't have a great appetite you have to take a lot of medications um, and and during this period of time we may see some symptoms of a graph versus host disease and look, some patients do get infections they're not always serious sometimes we can and we can manage a lot of them in the outpatient setting um, and one, one of the big things is most people will say they are extremely tired after their transplant um, and, and slowly that, that improves. Um, three to six months, bit of a roller coaster. For some people, they're like, mm, they're actually ticking along quite well and they're going better than they expected. And for other people, they're, they're, st they're battling with, with, with some of those you know, early complications. Um, and it, and it can be a bit challenging, and it really, and it, again, it does vary. Um, but generally, you know, as you as you you know, time goes on, you you slowly improve and you get stronger. Your appetite's getting better. We're you know reducing some of those medications. Again, in the donor transplant setting, you're probably going home with 20 odd medications on a daily basis, and and we should be you know you should be having a lot less of that sort of by this stage. Less visits to the hospital, less fatigue. Um, and we, but we may see some chronic graft versus host disease, maybe some of the early signs. Infections are still a, you know, risk for all of you, for all post, you know, all transplant recipients. And as I just previously said, vaccination schedule usually starts around the six month mark. Um, and you know, uh, around that time, that's you know, you may already be back at work, um, but six months is a good time to think about going back to work or study or whatever it is but that should be a gradual process and I always recommend that if you're thinking about going back to work then that it should be part-time it's just a good way to get back into it slowly how do I prevent infection um, another big question that I often get asked after transplant um, a lot of this is common sense a lot of the things you know that we should all be doing we should all wash our hands after we go to the toilet and before we prepare food etc um, clean your teeth, you know, maintain good personal hygiene. Um, these are things that we should all be doing, but you really need to do them. Um, take your medications, avoid sick people, lots of people, you know, confined areas, the football, the lifts, shopping at Christmas, you know, you don't know what the general public's, you know, they don't know that you've got, you know, that you're immune suppressed and they just cough and don't cover their face. And so that's why you should just be a little bit more mindful around crowds of people. 
Um, and just really very much for the adults, so donor transplants, there should be no gardening initially. <laughs> People go, oh, great, I don't need to rake up the dead leaves. Um, and the reason being is because lots of dead things like dead leaves and soil has lots of nasty funguses. Um, and while you're very immune suppressed, you can sort of inhale them and, and they can, so that's why we recommend that you don't initially. Um, it's a little bit laxer post, you know, autograft, um, but you just, you know, again, need to avoid soil and potting mix and things like that, particularly in the first few months after you transplant. Um, and, and construction sites, because they're like full of dust and, and lots of nasty, you know, particles that can potentially give you infections. And you can do all of this, and in fact we can stick you in a bubble and keep you away from everything, but patients still get infections, okay, and that's really from themselves. So we all have bugs, healthy, good bugs that live in us, but when your defences are down and all your natural, you know, it's not just your immune cells, but your gut is a really important defence, and, and you've kind of lost all your vaccine sort of ability to... So all those natural defences that we don't even think about, are down and so all those that healthy bacteria particularly in your gut can then get into spots where it shouldn't be like into your bloodstream so people still get infections even when they do all the right stuff so um, but by doing these sorts of things it, it, it really does reduce your risk of infection what about your anim pets and animals so big message always <coughs> wash your hands after you've touched any animal um, you should avoid sick animals, um, having young animals. So you, you shouldn't really think, great, we'll get that kitten or puppy, you know, when I get home. That's not a good idea. And the reason being is because young animals scratch and bite and, and, and that can potentially be a source of infection. So we would just generally suggest don't do that um, initially. You should avoid cleaning fish tanks, kitty litter. So another great excuse not to have to do those things. <laughs> But you certainly don't need to get rid of your pets. Just be really good at washing your hands after. And anything from the zoo. Um, vets and, and people that live on farms and work with animals, we would recommend that you don't really sort of do that sort of work and, and lots of contact with animals until about six months. Now, I know that, you know there's already been a, a session or two about nutrition, so just one slide um, about what you should and shouldn't eat. So eat fresh food, well-cooked food, um, and freshly prepared. I mean, that's, you know, good food hygiene, wash your hands, use clean, you know, cut crockery, cutlery, surfaces. I mean, we should all really be doing that anyway, but you should do it. You absolutely have to do it, okay? Um, and I get, you know, for you, you know, you need to avoid all these things. So just think raw, un you know, undercooked eggs um, and, and yummy cheese, yummy soft cheese. Unfortunately, it's out for a little while. Um, and eating from delis and but and the reason we say is because that kind of food it's not always you don't know how it's prepared and it's been sitting around for a long time it's sort of this low level temperature and and you and it you can get food poisoning from places like this and nasty bugs so that's why we say avoid those but just think fresh well cooked healthy food so try not to get too tied up with all the mm, what can I can and can't so the next thing that that's pretty you know. That sounds like a pain that you've got to put all those precautions in place after your transplant, but you don't have to do it forever. So really, you can really lax off. So for an autograft, I would say anywhere, sort of three months and beyond, you can start to lax off. I mean, you see your clinician, you know, your haematologist or your transplant nurse or whoever it is, enough to say, hey, is it okay if I have, you know, a bit of cheese or... So generally, you can start to, you know, about three months and, you know, we are flexible, you know, it, we try to put these rules in place but there is flexibility um, and generally for our donor transplants it's around sort of six months okay and that's when you're off a lot of your immune suppression generally and so but as I say it is flexible you know I have patients come to me and say please can I just have you know a piece of blue cheese and they're okay and so that that sort of thing is you know so they're not forever but certainly in the initial months following your transplant Hard to ask questions, can I have sex? People, like, that is a really hard question for, for people to ask. Um, it's not always brought up in consultations because, you know, a lot of us don't see it as a priority, but it can be a really big priority for patients. Um, and the short answer is, of course you can. 
Um, if you have any issues or worries or you worry that it's going to be painful or I might hurt my partner or then ask us okay so um, you know a lot of patients you know in my experience see that I don't bring it up I don't think it's you know my haematologist or my transplant loss they're, they're too busy that's not a priority for them but it's a really important thing potentially for you um, and you need to have that discussion and if there are problems there's lots of experts who are fantastic at managing some of these things and you know um, or it may just be a simple answer, no you won't hurt your partner and of course that's absolutely fine and you can you know sleep together and so just have that conversation if it's really worrying you um, and then just a couple of, a couple of things to think about um, that reduce your infection risk can I travel short answer yeah yes generally after six months if, in, un, in um, developed countries um, just a few things to think about insurance so there are a lot of limitations once you've had um, a, a condition um, but there are insurance companies that will insure patients who have had um, pre-existing conditions but just something to think about it's not so easy as but people like the Leukemia Foundation and they're, they're really good resources to help you source that um, you should ha be vaccinated at the very least have a flu vaccine but you should have had at least some of your vaccinations after your transplant um, you should avoid adventure travel just be bear in mind cruises they usually get lots of gastric outbreaks um, planes, confined areas, respiratory infections, just some things to think about when, you, when you're planning a trip. Again, you should always talk to your transplant team um, and we are, you know, can be flexible. When you shouldn't go when you're sick, um, generally under six months, you shouldn't go to underdeveloped countries where there and bad water sources and so, um, and where anywhere that requires live vaccines, like yellow fever and those sorts of things, certainly within that first year following your transplant. Tired, again, I think there's been sessions around fatigue and how to manage that, and exercise is really important. It's probably one of the top reported symptoms post transplant. The thing, you know, that really helps fatigue, and it's probably the last thing that you think about, is actually exercise and, and doing something. Um, exercise can really help your recovery. Um, gives you better appetite, better energy levels, makes, um, help you sleep. Some good messages, focus on what you can do rather than what you can't do. Um, focus on how you feel now, not how you might feel. Um, and make it part of your life. Exercise is good for all of us. Um, looking after your emotions, so you know, it's not uncommon it's not a bad thing that you feel down or anxious or you know and you need to you know find ways that really help you get through your recovery um, and it's normal to, to, to have some of these emotions um, but if they continue then you should seek help and there's plenty of, of help out there um, and that, you know there's certain I mean just coming to a day like this is probably helpful just talking to other people and oh my gosh it's not you know other people are experiencing that as well and um, there's certainly a lot of excellent professional help just a couple of other ideas S stay informed um, get organized gives you a bit of control you know you can take back some of that control um, talk to people. I know it's a bit of a cliche, you know, a shared pro problem is a less problem or whatever it is, problem that that one. Um, <laughs> but it does help. Um, and make sleep a priority. So it's, you know, important for all of us. Um, and just finally, in summary, you know, transplant is a significant insult. It's a really big insult on your body and it does take time to recover. It is a long recovery. Um, and you know there are side effects associated with transplant um, mid and long term and they, and they do vary greatly between people and for the majority of people you know they um, it ranges in the it's sort of mid to, to moderate but you need to be aware that, that they do exist um, and trust your team your transplant team they're a really good resource um, and they can point you in the right direction and, and, and help you talk to them um, and you know you need to take your care um, seriously and, and you need to think that you need to look after yourself a little bit more closely for your life and that just a couple of resources that I thought would be 
Good, and, and again, I'm happy to, to get, share my slides, but y your transplant team is an excellent resource. You know, you don't even have to ask them. Um, but there's some excellent things on the internet. Um, there's some really bad things on the internet, but there's some really good things. And that's why I say ask your transplant team. They can point you in the right direction. And look, a lot of this is American, but I do want to say this Be The Match is a fabulous resource and gives lots of tips and, and points about your recovery all types of trans and in sections and it's all free it is you know it's American but it's very relevant so I would highly recommend that and all these resources are free you know and and just coming here today I'm sure has been really beneficial for, for many of you thank you